<laughs> oh, there's an idea. I like it. <laughs> All right. We're, uh, we're uh, five past. Um, let me do a quick uh, roll call here. So I have uh, Alexis, Joe, Liz, Matt, uh, Zhang. Um, is Brendan, Brian, Jeff, or Michelle here? I miss. Oh, it's Brian Grant. Okay, I see Brian. Cool. Jeff or Michelle? I don't see right now. Okay, but we have six. We have quorum, so we're good. Um, uh, let's go kick it off to Liz for the agenda. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, we will move very swiftly on to welcoming Amy, who I hope is on the call. Amy, are you here? Sure am. Hello. Awesome. So welcoming Amy, who is going to be the driving force uh, behind projects to help us in the CNCF. Do you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your focus? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Amy Scavarda. Um, you can find me at Amy on Twitter. You can find me at Amy at Linux Foundation. My focus right now is going to be um, kind of building more of the SIGs, building out our project services. And you might have known me from my previous role at Red Hat, where I was the Gluster community lead. So. Game on. Good to see you all. Big welcome to Amy. Yay. <laughs> welcome, Amy. How do we do applause on this thing? Yeah. yeah. Slash applause. I was just seeing it. <clears throat> I just said it into the chat. Awesome. Woohoo. All right. Keep going. Uh, yeah, Chris, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do the shameless uh, shakedown. So uh, China is coming up in uh, a few weeks. It's a little bit hard to believe that uh, we're doing another um, KubeCon so quickly, but hope to see many of you uh, there. It's a great program. Um, final kind of call for um, you know CFP and sponsorships for North America are open and will close in uh, about a month from now on July, I think July 12th. Uh, end of day. So if you're interested in speaking or sponsoring, please, um, you know, you know, feel free to contact us. Uh, and then for Europe, uh, next year we'll be in Amsterdam uh, on March 30th through April um, 2nd. So kind of exciting to be in a new city uh, in, in Europe. The final kind of thing is, uh, I know many of you were at KubeCon, um, you know, recently <coughs> in Barcelona, um, and you know, generally we've been talking to a lot of our kind of members and attendees, trying to get feedback on how to uh, consistently and constantly improve uh, the program. So I kind of like to open up, you know, the TOC call not only TOC members but also community members on this call to kind of give any feedback on what went, went, went well, what would you like to see improved, and and so on. So we are going to be producing a transparency report and I think we're going to try to get it out by the end of this month that will basically you know fully showcase you know what people's you know feedback were on different talks the overall program yada yada from from surveys that we do after the event but I'd like to open it up now to just get any feedback from the kind of wider wider group here in the TOC on, on how things went. Well I'll start because you know me I never hesitate on this stuff. <laughs> Sure. So I got three things. So number one, I, I think um, it felt a lot less vendory this time around, which I thought was really good. Um, there, especially the keynotes, I think were very much focused on users and use, use cases. Um, I think calling out sponsored keynotes helped make them be a little bit less sponsored for, you know, if that makes sense. Um, so I really like that change in that, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, um, I, the venue was problematic. Um, you know, and I say this because like VMware holds VMworld Europe there every year and like, a lot of people at VMware love the venue. But I think, you know, there was a lot of walking, the food was crap, and some of those big sort of warehouse size, hangar size rooms with the partitions didn't do a great job of sound isolation. Um, okay. And then the yeah. second thing, and I don't know the right answer to this, is that my busiest day at KubeCon is the Monday before KubeCon. Because yeah. we end up with all these like co-located events. And so I feel like that's where I'm actually getting dragged into like 12 different directions. And so I don't know if there's an answer to that because I think you know, just naturally everybody wants to co-locate stuff with KubeCon. But like that, that Monday feels like it's, it's gotten overloaded to the point of being, being really hard for at least me to manage. Okay. 
Do you, uh, on the sponsored keynote thing, do you think explicitly calling them out as sponsored keynote forced the keynotes to be better? Because I, I did notice that this year they were uh, way better than they have been in previous times. Well, that's just because I spoke as a sponsor. <laughs> I appreciate that, Chris. No, I actually, I, for what it's worth, I think that they, I think that they, you know, for whatever reason, they yeah. came across as less sort of like, come by my shit and more like, you know, let's talk about how we relate to the community, which I think is a good change. Yeah, and I'm just wondering if that was related to them being explicitly called out that way where people may have decided to change things up. But yeah, I didn't notice I would guess so. Um, I, I think most of the credit actually goes to Brian Lyles and Janet Kua, who did pre-calls with all the regular keynote speakers and the sponsored keynote speakers and talked about what the community was ex expecting. <sighs> We try that all the time, but yeah, maybe Brian and Janet cracked the code this time. Well, I think also um, it might be good to collect the ones that were particularly good. And not only for, like from um, maybe the survey content has that, but there might be something more qualitative. Um, like I particularly liked, I've, <clears throat> I have personally found the landscape a little problematic mm -hmm. in its categories, not particularly being helpful to me. However, the one, I can't remember who it was that used it to show what things that they were using in their um, deployment. And I found that to be really helpful. Like somebody's actually saying we're using these particular things in these buckets. And that, I don't know, I found that format to be appealing, informative, also revealing of things that companies often don't tell you. And so that kind of opening up and sharing things that are not about their, what they're selling or providing, um, I found particularly just like, gen it felt genuine and it felt educational. And it was also a great callback to the landscape. So it, I think picking out some formats that are appealing and su suggesting that they pick one of those formats or propose a format might help because then the format leads them towards presenting something that's educational and of value as opposed to a pitch. Yeah. Anything I see Sugo said about track hosts, how do people, people generally pretty positive about that? I thought that was great actually, really good. Um, I mean, we had a track host in our team for two tracks and he was a little bit he felt very much kind of in the background, which may have been a good thing. Um, so he was kind of unsure what the track hosts were supposed to do. Uh, so I think in the future, clearer guidance on what your expectations are for track hosts would be good. Okay, Dual duly noted, Alexis. So, I mean, one thing that I think um, on the track host thing, I think it might be worthwhile to explore doubling down on that idea. I know um, like QCon, which is different from KubeCon because this isn't confusing at all like actually has the, the track host help curate the talks and actually sort of bring speakers in. And it creates, you know, uh, a much more curated feel for, for, the, for, the, for the talks. Because I think we do have the problem where there's just way too many submissions across, you know, way too many topics. There's duplication. I think, you know, that's just a matter of scale. So, so maybe sharding out some of the sort of um, picking the talks responsibilities, you know, might be something to explore. And I think also just from a SIG perspective, um, it was an incredible opportunity to of gathering people together. I think that if there were some kind of a, I didn't think about this in advance, but some kind of like after the intros and deep dives, a space for people to overflow to, um, it could help with that community building. And then also we kind of retroactively are pulling together all of the security based talks and I wonder whether we could do that, you know, in advance in the future, whether, whether it be a formal track or not, I think pulling together a thread of these are all talks along a theme could really help um, people with maybe some um, spaces that are allocated towards discussions around a theme so people can gather. Um, I think that would be really helpful because it was kind of hard to connect to people. You always had to create meeting spots and miss something. Uh, you know, like I think some kind of less formal gathering spaces um, would be really helpful. Uh, on the topic of, of talks themselves, 
one of the things that really jumped out at me during the serverless practitioner summit was that um, you know people get up there and they talk about what they submitted for CFP. So it's basically what people want to talk about because sort of gets pushed onto the community. And it'd be really nice if there was some way if we could sort of allow that op to be sort of turned around and allow the community to tell us what do they want to hear relative to talks, right? And just because, you know, we may have a whole bunch of talks out there for any of the particular tracks that they're, they may be interesting to themselves, but there may be a gap in terms of what the community actually wants to hear about. And I don't know what the mechanism would be, but it'd be really great if we could come up with some way for the community to say, for the next coupon, I would like to hear talks on this topic or that topic or that topic. And then I'll encourage people to do CFPs on those particular topics, hopefully. I second that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, Lewis, I didn't, I, I didn't hear you well. So um, if, if you're oh, sorry, can you hear me okay? I, yeah, yeah, we hear you now. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking that I second that. I, uh, I participated a lot in OpenStack. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a plus and minus to that model also, but I feel that the community uh, changes every six months. And I, from my point of view, I see that the community, uh, I, again, I've been participating in KubeCon since 1. Point, sorry, in Kubernetes is 1.3. And I've noticed now specifically in KubeCon Barcelona that persistence is, change, is something that people are looking into. Mm -hmm. and uh, I feel that maybe it's something that we can uh, talk about or allow them, you know, get more feedback from the users to see what they would like to see in talks. So, I, I th okay, I think some of the Did feedback. You hear that okay? Did you yeah, hear yeah, that? no, I, I heard a lot of clear. I think we could expand a little bit of our post-conference survey to maybe include more of, you know, what what you didn't hear or what would you like to hear, so we get some more of that concrete. Um, data from books. Yeah, I think and it's a good first step, yeah. And to echo what Sarah was saying, um, the very last day in the Kubernetes storage SIG, the last question was, well, what, what is the difference between the SIGs in, you know, CNCF and this SIG? And <laughs> that was a bummer that that was the very last day of the conference, the very last question, um, you know, where people could have gotten involved at the beginning. So I don't know if maybe we could have like a want to be involved booth, you know, that the maybe co-chairs can recruit people and have them better understand it. Cause it still seems like there's a lot of fog around what, you know, what value there is, what happens in those, how do people get involved? I'm not sure how to um, communicate that better. Okay. Th th thanks. I think um, one of the things Amy, you know, and, and I will be working on is as, as the CNCF SIGs get booted up, we'll try to be a little bit more clear on kind of the marketing and delineation between, you know, what they do versus the Kubernetes SIGs and just overall, you know, the role in the wider ecosystem. But that, that's something for us to, uh, to kind of work on in the coming months. That's reminded me that I heard good things about the um, project booths. I think they were well received. Yeah, no, the Promethe I talked to the Prometheus maintainers, they they loved it and um, just like nonstop traffic, which sometimes is challenging as a maintainer, juggling everything, but they they were able to do it. Um, so I think we're gonna expand our project maintainer boots for KubeCon San Diego is, is the plan because the feedback's been so positive. Yeah, same with the Rook. I talked to them quite a bit and they were very pleased to be able to talk to so many people and have that opportunity. And it really brought in, you know, a diverse people, you know, set of committers, from different companies to represent that. So that was neat to see. One factor for the CNCF SIGs is that they'll get their own um, uh, maintainer track talks uh, in San Diego, just like the projects do. The, Can we make sure we do that earlier in the schedule rather than later? Because maybe that would spark some people's uh, desire exactly. to be part of that and communicate with those people throughout the week rather than the very last day of the conference. Can you elaborate on what the maintainer track is? It, it, you know, like, we can do that offline. I'm just not really familiar with that or point me to something. No, there, it, um, there's a, a long blog post on it. But it, in summary, we have the call for papers track, which is about two thirds of the talks um, at the event. And that goes through a program committee of about 100 people and is organized by the co-chairs. And then separately, uh, every CNCF project and uh, Kubernetes SIG and now uh, CNCF SIG 
uh, also gets uh, an intro and, and deep dive talk. And those are listed as the maintainer track talks. And so there's about five or six of them going on in parallel through the three days. Great, we actually participated in it, just didn't quite realize the track format. Thank you. No worries. Sure. Uh, to, to, to reflect a little bit on Joe's point earlier, uh, you know, a lot of people have expressed there's a lot to get done in day zero um, with like the Kubernetes community, you know, you know, meeting or contributor meeting and, you know, all the, you know, cloud native storage day. If that was spread over two days, would that be beneficial for folks or it's just like two days of just a lot to attend to? Because it's, it's, there's a lot of going on in day zero, but, um, you know, I, I don't know if we want to extend KubeCon to be the full week, uh, essentially, so. Um, no. <laughs> It's too much. Go. I mean, I was there for Cephalocon starting on Sunday, and by Thursday, I would just yeah. Anyway. So I mean, so one thing I would say, Chris, is is yep. you know, um, there's co-located events that are sponsored by companies, very vendor centric. Correct. Um, those take attention and time. I know they're a revenue source, um, but they also take time and attention uh, away from things that are more community focused. Um, and so if we're looking to slim down the, the number of things going on at KubeCon so that it actually is more focused on the projects mm -hmm. in a way from the vendor days, you know, on that Monday might be, might be a good way to go. Yeah. One, one other thing that might be worth considering is, is maybe just breaking up some of those, um, co-located events so that they're either shorter or they're sort of split into sections. Uh -huh. So that people could attend multiple co-located events because one consistent bit of feedback I got was that you know people wanted to attend maybe more than one co-located event, but but were prevented from doing so. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's, a sched, it's a tough scheduling problem with multiple constituents that all have different <laughs> views on on this. So um, yeah, if you have ideas on you know how to improve things versus, you know, maybe forcing things to be half days or across multiple days, front end, tail end, just please send it our way. It's just, it, it's a tough problem. Just a uh, thing I'd like to add is, um, is there a, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, 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 I hear you. You're a little bit light, but I could hear you. Okay. Um, is uh, there, one of the things that I, I, I feel that we, it could be dangerous, not dangerous, but we have to be careful of is uh, the amount of time we allocate to CNCF projects themselves. Uh, it may be at the sandbox level, at the, at the next levels up. I just wanna be careful with, with those types of talks that they, and how they compare to as a normal CFP and how they mm -hmm. compete with each other. Um, I'm concerned that um, there may be more introduction to projects becoming sandboxes just to get talks in. Uh, because otherwise they wouldn't get a talk in, right? We have to be yeah. careful how we manage that because if not, we're going to get that uh, that view, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, the previous TOC actually made an explicit decision not to promote any sandbox projects at all. Um, and I think we should stick to that or, or at least officially change it. And I, I don't think that is actually happening in practice. We, for example, had a sandbox project presented on a, at a keynote presentation. Um, so I think the, this TOC should make a clear decision whether they're going to stick with the plan to not actively promote sandbox projects. And if so, we, we, should, we should stick. We just have an actual sandbox and put them in there and then everyone else can have a normal booth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think giving that clear feedback to the program committee could be could be good because it is challenging sometimes if you had a sponsored keynote or something, they, they could kind of choose. Um, what they do. I don't know what the specific context was uh, in, in, in this case, but um, I think that's clear feedback that TOC could give to. to the this person. was open SDS and it was in Brian's keynote. So there was obviously some miscommunication around okay. that. Okay. Yeah, I, we'll circle with the program committee. To, uh, I, I mentioned that to Brian. Okay. Oh, already. So, so he's, okay. he's, he's aware of that, that you won't see the project overviews mentioned the sandbox going forward. And, and small thing on the schedule, I think maybe delineating 
like sandbox projects, explicitly calling them out as such could be useful on the schedule now that I think about it. But Okay, uh, any other? Uh, sorry, just to be clear, I think they should not be on the schedule. I mean, they should not be, they should not receive uh, maintainer track. Interesting. Because that constitutes the, pro the promotion that we've decided not to do. I guess it depends how you define marketing versus event space. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think the TOC would have to be clear on on that specific thing, giving them like an event event space to have their own little session to do an intro and deep dive. I don't think would necessarily constitute over marketing, but that that's my that's my opinion. I think we have this constant challenge and this constant compromise between you know the levels of due diligence for sandbox projects versus the amount of airtime they get from the CNCF and the events. The, the, the challenge is if we, if we give them a lot of airtime, that's the fact of promoting them and, you know, perhaps putting them at a stage where they're not yet ready um, on the, you know, and, and that should perhaps require then more due diligence. But if we want to keep the bar low, which I think is a good idea, then we should probably minimize some of those things. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, like I've always said, like, on the keynote stage or stuff like that, there should be no sandbox projects, but giving them like an intro or deep dive always seemed reasonable. But I, I think maybe the TOC needs to have a discussion on, on kind of their stance um, on this and maybe come back with a statement to the, to the program committee. So. Yeah, I am wondering whether sandbox should at least only have one rather than two slots. Th that could be a, a compromise uh, also, yeah. So, so maybe we could kind of create an action item for the TOC to kind of discuss this over the next, you know, a uh, bit to come up with some formal feedback to the program committee and we'll kind of work from there. Sounds good. All right, we're uh, about almost halfway through. I think we should try to go to... Yeah. Well, if you have any other feedback on KubeCon, you could always send an email to events at cncf.io. Ping, Dan, or I, we're, we're always happy to kind of um, hear from you. So, all right, SIGs, go ahead, Liz. <laughs> all right, so we have two SIGs now. I believe they're both solid, right? Um, Chris, are we looking for a formal vote here for these uh, yes. TOC approval? Yeah, so uh, storage has uh, added some essentially co-chairs and tech leads and based on the governance process, we need a for essentially a formal vote, but uh, we have quorum on the TOC today. Um, so if there's no opposition for Aaron Boyd uh, to take an addition co-chair role and <clears throat> Bradley Childs uh, for the tech lead role for six storage, then um, you know, we could kind of consider that approved and, and not do like a formal email vote. So if there's no one opposed to this on the TOC right now, uh, I'll consider it approved and go. Any other statements or um, six storage, maybe Alex or someone from six storage wants to make the case why, why they're doing this? The uh, um, so, so we're doing this um, for two reasons. One, um, the, we, we had a vacant co-chair slot um, uh, and Erin has sort of put her hat in the ring. Um, and I think you know, she's, she would be extremely well qualified to, to do this role. Plus she's also you know, very well known in, in the community. And similarly, um, Brad um, would be extremely valuable in a, in a tech lead role and, and he currently um, co-chairs the, the Kubernetes storage SIG as well. So, it, it just brings a lot of experience to the to the team and, and helps with the projects that we're that we're looking at. Cool. So, um, for my is, is, is there you know in in the SIG charters or in the when we define the SIGs, is there a set number of 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 chairs and tech leads? Because I know with the Kubernetes SIGs, we kind of leave it up to the SIGs to figure out how they want to structure themselves. I'm just curious. I mean. My recollection is it's uh, defined for three co-chairs, but I'm not sure there's a definition on tech leads. Yeah, I, I, I recall that being similar, but I have to look at the... Yeah, the, the, the SIG charter says, says three co-chairs, but um, doesn't specify a limit on, or doesn't specify any number of tech leads. 
Okay. Is that the SIG charter for this SIG or is that for all SIGs? I'm just all, all, okay. all, all SIGs. SIGs. Okay, I don't remember seeing that. Okay, cool. And, um, this is Luis. I'm just a little bit concerned about two people in the same company and the same, you know. So if you need another tech lead, I, I, I throw my head in there. So let me know. We can discuss that after, Alex. Yeah. I knew you were going to say that, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. Well, you know, I see. Are any of the other current co chairs, I don't believe either of the current co chairs are Red Hat. No. I don't believe any of the current tech leads are. Or not Red Hat. Okay, so it'll be two out of no. seven. Okay. So yeah, I also think, and, and I think Amy can step into this role, but it would be great um, to actually look up at whether we're following the rules. Yep. So we went through a, a bunch of um, thrash or um, iterations um, in getting our material together. And then I realized yesterday that Dan hadn't pull requested himself into yep. a TOC contributor. So I think like, let's, you know, like, I think it, having it, everybody double check. It's, awesome. it's on the agenda. Don't worry, Amy and I will be we'll be on it soon awesome yeah i would i would suggest we give this another two weeks or so just to let everyone weigh in because i'm not sure that everyone's uh given it full consideration okay well in terms of the tech leads uh yes okay. I'm, I'm fine deferring it to, to next time and letting six storage come back um so that that, that works for me too Okay. Cool. All right. Um, we had a great suggestion. Uh, what well, came to me through Alexis. I know some other people were involved. Sarah was one of those people around uh, encouraging diversity by using the SIGs as a uh, nurturing ground to get more uh, underrepresented groups into roles within those SIGs. I think that is an awesome idea, um, unless anybody has any. Uh, kind of objections to that I want to just try and get that incorporated into the SIG I can't remember we call it the process or charter whatever it is um, so if anybody has any comments on that I think it was a really good email discussion about it otherwise I think we should incorporate that And then the last question on this slide is uh, what SIG would like to be formed next? And I saw in the agenda document, I think uh, Ken, I don't know if Ken is on the call, but he was suggesting, ah, I've forgotten what the name of it was, traffic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right, Liz. We, um, uh, we've been a little bit slow. I think when just as, as soon as the, the SIG where the documentation was formed for what those are, we had uh, we were excited to you know, go over and reincarnate the networking working group into uh, well either between SIG traffic or SIG network or or maybe maybe the both of them. But anyway, it was to expand the scope. The networking goes deep and wide. There's a backlog of things to review. Uh, things like SMI were just announced. Um, it's a happening space. Um, Ken and I have been co-chairing the uh, networking working group for some time. So we've spoken with um, Matt earlier on. Um, uh, I've gotten a draft proposal that's yet to be uh, PR, yet to be an issue, yet to be created. So, so yeah, I think we're raising our hand there in terms of up next. Fantastic. Um, I think maybe in the interest of time offline, I would like to request that... Um, Co-chairs from SIG Storage and SIG Security, having been through the process of forming your SIGs, if you have feedback on the process and what, you know, if there's anything we need to tie up, let's do that kind of sooner rather than later. So let us know. All right. Uh, and I think there's no reason why we have to only form one SIG at a time, right? So if anybody else is out there thinking, uh, I also have a SIG that I want to form, you are also welcome to start drafting your proposal. I think that yeah. Michelle and I will be trying to put something together on apps and app delivery. Um, so I want to mention this because there are a few other folks who are involved in drafting some ideas around that back in November and December. So if, uh, if you want to be involved in this, get in touch with me 
or Michelle or both of us by email, please. Yeah, I was going to suggest that that we get the uh, core and applied architectures together as well, and I can assist with that if if needed. Um, it seems like one of the more necessary of the CNCF SIGs, um, <clears throat> and we can start putting that together sooner rather than later. Can, can you do a formal call on the TOC list, both Alexis and Quinton, just to raise awareness? Not not everyone attends this call. So. Sure, we'll do. All right, I'm just opening the issue T213. This is the archiving process, right? Uh, sorry, it should be. No, no, it isn't. Oh, it's the it's Brandon CVE process, right? Did I linked the wrong issue. Sorry, once. <laughs> no, no, no. It's my it was my memory. Okay. <laughs> Do we have Brandon on the call? I don't want to go check. One sec. If the critical Brandon exception. Yeah, no, if he's on the phone, what is it, star, star, no, I forgot how to on you on, on Zoom, but. Brandon, do you read me? <laughs> um, if not, I'm happy to summarize kind of, kind of the issue. Uh, yeah, star six to unmute in case you're there, Brandon. All right, let's assume he is not, but, um, uh, the issue at hand was basically uh, as our projects get kind of more mature, you have to develop some process to do security disclosures, CVEs, and so on. And so some of our projects have gone through this, and it is a bit of a somewhat of a manual process to get uh, an actual CVE ID and, and file something uh, and publicly disclose it. Uh, so we started a kind of a discussion of, you know, whether it makes sense for CNCF to kind of be, uh, you know, a CNA, which kind of could produce these IDs or use other tools out there. Um, you know, I think the discussion's been a little bit mixed. Um, also, just I think last week, GitHub uh, announced a bunch of kind of features in this space that kind of help, help us out quite a bit. Um, I don't know if people have any strong uh, feelings uh, on, on kind of where we should go with this, but um, you know, I, I've had personally a lot of conversations uh, with GitHub and being given them a lot of feedback on kind of how they can improve security disclosures and they've been taking a lot of that to heart and uh, are going to have features in the future like producing CVIDs. So, um, you know, it could be a decision where we just kind of uh, continue to wait for GitHub and work with them to make sure the tools work for us or you know, we could do something else. So I, I, I don't know how people strongly feel about this, but I think it's, it's gotten a lot better with their new uh, tooling announcements, um, at least in my opinion. I've got to agree that the things that GitHub have been doing in this space are great. Um, I don't think what they've done so far actually gives the, the, the CNA problem a solution yet. Not yet. But, um, uh, I know there was a question raised about what the other Linux Foundation foundations are doing is that um yeah a lot of them either uh there's two approaches one they will just go through their res like a respective uh company that can produce cnas like you know that is a cna like red hat or something could could do it for their respective uh projects some will use uh hacker one uh to do the disclosure process and create the um you know, cv id from that so those are kind of, or some will just do the uh, MITRE form, essentially that, ex or the equivalent of that to create the ID. Yeah, I think one thing I was hoping Brandon might be able to share with us, or maybe anybody else on the call might know, if there are any examples where using, relying on the MITRE process has been insufficient or caused problems for us. I mean, yeah, the most recent case, I don't know if, if Matt is on the call, but when Envoy went through it, uh, I think generating the ID didn't take super long, but all the other shit that you have to do with, you know, downstream dependencies, all that stuff was, was painful, but that's not really the ID generation bit. It's just notifying. Yeah, I mean, our, our experience was that it was, not very much work to get the ID. I mean, there was, there was some latency, like you have to fill out the web form um, and then it takes a day to get the ID back. And then there's some latency again, when you go to finalize the CVE, uh, it takes another day or two for them to update the text. 
but per what Chris said, in, I mean, in our experience, that time is dwarfed by all, all the other stuff. So at least from our perspective, we don't have a problem with, with what we did. And okay, I mean, we could make a call to other projects, but I, I think GitHub is very interested in solving this problem from my conversations with them, at least on the ID generation part in the future. Um, the other parts of just notifying all your, you know, downstream folks, like I, that's just a hard problem in, in general. I don't know how to do that uh, automatically. Yeah, I I think I am fine with that kind of status quo leading towards being able to use these GitHub solutions unless and until we come up with some reason why it really isn't good enough. I'm happy with it. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. I think maybe we should um, sort of document this and kind of close that yeah. issue two on three then. Yeah, I saw I saw in a comment from Dims. Um, yeah, if there's uh, specific things on why it doesn't work well for Kubernetes, please let us um, know, Dims, and 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 we'll try to address it. So I didn't know. I, I thought for Kubernetes, um, the uh, CVEs were generated through either someone at Google or Red Hat who had basically access uh, to do that as a CNA. So I don't know if the ID generation was a problem or or something else. So please, please comment on that issue before we, before we close it out, okay? That's fair enough, yeah. Cool, what's, what's next? Oh yeah, cool. Who wants to take this one? I, I, I'm happy to take this one actually, yeah. So um, I think uh, it's been pretty public over the last few days that, uh, you know, Rocket is being kind of archived by Red Hat and um, personally I would like us to um, well take a vote on archiving exercising our new archiving process and moving Rocket into the CNCF archives as well. Um, I have reached out to uh, most of the maintainers and I would say the general feeling is that that is from what they've said to me I think that's that's the right move. I think they, they agree that is the right move. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's open that up for discussion. Any thoughts, concerns, questions? They did actually raise and some interesting points about the kind of wording on the uh, archiving process where we say things like, we're not gonna take uh, service desk requests, but we're also going to support transitional documentation. Um, so we need to kind of clarify that. Um, I think the spirit is understood, even if the wording is not. Clear. The um, the only thing about the process that I thought was a bit weird is it doesn't include a presentation to the CNCF, even if that's effectively an exit interview. I think there ought to be a presentation from the maintainers about what went right, what went wrong, any kind of potential future, and, and a place for people to ask questions. Because at the moment, there's a at least two weeks email come issue discussion, but no formal presentation. Do you think that could be an optional presentation? I mean, I can obviously imagine a scenario where the maintainers do not want to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool idea though. But I think doing it as an option would be would be nice. Yeah. I mean, I think in this case, it's relatively straightforward and, but there could be cases where it's a, where it's a more complicated process. And, there, and certainly there, there are, you know, there is possible discussions about other people who might want to take over the project. You can imagine in other situations, it might be even more complex. I was going to raise a similar question. I don't know if this got resolved, but there was some, some question as to where the IP goes when things get archived. I think Joe raised the question and then the, the counter question is, you know, what happens if it wants to come out of archive? Uh, has that all been resolved? And if so, what is the final yeah. decision there? The default, it lives with the Linux Foundation, just like anything in, in CNCF per se. Um, if there is a desire to move somewhere else, maybe like another nonprofit, um, we're, we're happy to support it as long as the project wants to do it. Um, it could never go to like a for-profit entity, but like, hey, I don't know, maybe I want to, you know, uh, go to the Apache or something. We could 
try to happily arrange that. It takes definitely some work on our end, but as long as a project wants to do that, we're happy to um, support it. Oh, just, just to be clear, are we moving it? Uh, are we moving the ownership from the CNCF to the Linux Foundation, or are we not moving the ownership? Uh, it's it's all uh, it's a little complex. It's all part of the Linux Foundation anyway. CNCF is uh, directly under the LF. So I understand, would, but does, yeah. does the IP stay in exactly the same place when we right. archive the project, or does it move? In this case, it stays exactly where it is. Okay, that makes sense. I thought it was moving. So, I mean, just one thing as we roll this out, you know, as this is the first project that's being archived, there's going to be a lot of questions. There's going to be a, like probably some press around it. You know, there may be some confusion. I think we just got to be ready to sort of like, you know, make sure that we can clear up any confusion, direct people to the right folks, be sort of authoritative about any answers, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I think we don't rush this. Let's let's be diligent. Do it. Do it slow. Come up with you know basically get everyone on the same page. But I totally agree with you, Joe. Let's let's not rush this. Get everything documented. Get a fact created, and 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 do our best and set the example for uh, for projects moving forward. I think think that sounds great, and I think the um, the timeline in the process it says at least two weeks. So there's no there's no reason to rush. Did were, you think they're open for a presentation? By the way, Liz, I know the Rocket folks fairly well. I don't. It's a little bit. <laughs> ask them, right? Like you know. Yeah, let's like... let's ask them. Let's ask them if they would like to volunteer. <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Any other comments from anyone around Rocket? Okay. Okay, is Michelle here? Yeah, I, I, I don't see her. Yeah, that's a shame. Uh, looks like she'd made some really great points here. We want to try and um, clarify what graduation criteria are for spec projects in particular. Um, I think this has been, uh, the question has originally been raised around graduation criteria because of projects like TAF. Um, but I can understand for other projects that want to move out of the sandbox. I think some of the, the measures will be the same. So things like, what do we mean by an end user? Um, yeah, so this is, this is Doug. I, I, from the Cloud Events perspective, we're very interested in this. There were actually two different questions that popped up because we're considering going from sandbox to incubator. And the first question, which is the easier one is, is there a requirement that the spec have to be at a certain level, right? Can it be alpha or beta or does it have to be 1.0? Uh, my assumption has been that there is no version number requirement on us, but I wanted a clarification from the TOC on that first. And then the second question is exactly what you talk about, Liz, is what does end user mean for a spec perspective, right? Is it just three products are using the spec or that they're end users of those products using the spec? Yeah, I think to that first point, Michelle made a very good uh, statement there about wanting to see that the spec is stable and unambiguous. Uh, I feel that taking that to the point where you say, and therefore must be at version 1.0 might encourage people to uh, use a number that may or may not be appropriate to the actual state of the spec. <laughs> Right, you don't want to force them to go 1.0 prematurely, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. In, 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 incubation products projects are not required to be at 1.0 either, so it seems asymmetric. Yeah, but I, what's interesting yeah. is I don't think the document says anything about version numbers at any at any level, even graduation, which I think is kind of interesting. I suppose it would be reasonable to expect that at graduation it was at at least 1.0. But I mean, that's kind of for some definition of 1.0, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Version, version numbers mean nothing in this industry, sadly. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. So my, my takeaway from that is then there is no requirement of version number, which, I, which is what I assumed, and that, that's okay. I think the bigger question is end user. Well, actually, I think there is also the points about stable and unambiguous spec. How do we judge? I mean, f both act graduation level and that uh, incubation level, like how stable and, well, I guess we'd all hope that any spec is unambiguous. Um, 
I, I guess one thing we could do is we could ask the SIGs to, you know, or, you know, the appropriate SIG to review it and decide that it is or isn't unambiguous. And we could also be looking at, I don't know, time since last change. Um, well, I would also, I'd ask, how could you possibly consider it to be stable and ambiguous if there's no applications that have used it, right? If it's just vendors who have mutually agreed that their implementation is good, but they themselves don't have users that are interoperable, I don't see how one could say it is unambiguous. Like you just have Sorry, no yeah. Yeah, I wasn't meaning to say that would be the only criteria. I was just looking at the bullets in front of me and working through them one at a time. I completely agree with you. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, sandbox incubation is about the fact that, you know, something has wide participation beyond single vendor. It's in production being used by users. And I think that same, like that in general, that's what we're looking for. I think that applies to specs also. Um, one thing we might want to explore is uh, requirements for some sort of test suite against the spec, right? Because that's that's one way to start, you know, uh, it's, it's a level of maturity that, you know, we expect in terms of projects as they move towards graduation in terms of testing. And it also is, is helpful with respect to uh, interoperability between implementations. I was under the impression that we only housed specs with reference implementations. Um, is that true or are we considering being home to specs that do not have come along with a reference implementation which would be presumably that some sort of test suite i don't think that's mentioned in the criteria as of right now but i think even if we have something that has a reference implementation with it i mean like Spiffy versus spire i think it's still worthwhile to have a test suite associated with the spec that's different from the test suite against the against the, um, the implementation. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm, I'm just not sure that it's possible to write a test suite against a spec that doesn't have a reference <laughs> implementation. But yeah, I, I, would, I would encourage us to, to mandate a reference implementation with the specs, but I, I don't know what that, how that sits with the rest of the TOC. Well, I, I, well, I think what we can say is that for any spec, you know, before it moves past Sandbox, we wanna see at least one, you know, open source, implementation of that spec. Right, it doesn't have to be in the CNCF, but at least, you know, open source to some definition of open source might be might be another requirement that we want to talk about. So just from a procedural perspective, because I know this, this issue has been lingering for quite a while now, um, would it be, okay? these are all great topics, but would, would it be possible for us to circle back around to the end user discussion? Because that's the one topic that I really need to get clarity on for the Cloud Events project before they can move forward on whether they want a good incubator or not. Um, I just want to get a read from the TOC on what their definition of end user means. So, so I would like, say real users using it in production. So it's not just yes. a, it's not just the, the spec is implemented by somebody. It's people are actually using that implementation yeah. of the spec. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Like okay. through proxy, say like through like a cloud provider offering the implementation of said spec through and, and it being used by its respective end users would be good enough. I'm, I'm assuming. It. Okay, that's, that's what I assume, but I just wanted to check. Okay, thank you. And do you actually need like company names or people using it or just it's sort of a, a statement that says we have three users, but I can't tell you who they are? <laughs> uh, I, it would be good to have those listed for due diligence purposes. Okay. I, think, I know that that is a problem that um, Tuff have raised as well, where I think they do have, you know, several nameable end users now, but, um, you know, there would be a number where that becomes hard. Um, but I think, yeah, we have to maybe take it on a case-by-case -case basis and if there, people are not nameable. There are some private, like, companies that don't want to be publicly listed, and if that's the case, maybe for like the case of tough, maybe that can be privately shared with the TOC to um, at least prove that there are end users. But I know there's some sensitivities about where tough, tough is being used. Okay, sounds reasonable, thank you. Um, one other thing that I, I'd be interested in, you know, one scenario that I, I'm not saying this is happening, but just thinking about this problem in general, is that if we have a spec 
and all the users are using a proprietary implementation and then the open source implementation of that spec ends up being sort of window dressing that isn't actually used in production. That to me seems like an anti-pattern and something that we don't want to support. We don't want, like, I, I, like we don't want the CNCF to actually sort of be a way to sort of like, you know, open wash stuff, right? We want to see real true usage of open systems. Um, so yeah. as we think about these criteria, that might be something we want to think about. Yeah. So does that say that the vendor implementation needs to pass the open source test suite to kind of prove that it is an implementation of the open source I, spec? Well, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, you know, if we have like a spec and the only implementations that are being used in production are commercial implementations, yeah. I'm not sure that's a place where we want to be. I think that's worth having that discussion. I also think we, you know, you want to think about like, if you have two vendors who each say that they implement it and their end users use it, that doesn't mean it's actually, like there's different ways to, to assert that you conform to the spec, right? Like, so just because you have a test suite that passes for both vendors doesn't mean the end users that would try to switch vendors would be able to, right? And so I think there has to be some uh, you know, and I would encourage that the project themselves has to assert why they think they're fulfilling this criteria, not just ask the TCOC to be more specific about the criteria, like elaborate a little bit and then we can like, and then the TOC can kind of evaluate like, okay, here's what more of what we'd like to see in this direction. Yeah. And then I, I think, you know, it's worth reiterating that there's always a level of judgment with respect to the TOC in these things. And so there is no sort of like, if you check all the boxes then like everybody's hands are tied and you automatically get promoted here. I think that, you know, these, you know, the, the criteria there are, are a guideline. I think it's, it's a guideline both for the TOC and for the projects, but I, you know, I don't think we're trying to foresee every situation and every, um, you know, every possible eventuality here. I, in your case, Joe, if there's like a particular spec that you're worried about in, in that case, it would be good to explicitly. Um, I mean, wow. nothing off the top of my head. I mean, as we look at sort of like the 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 open traces census stuff, I think um, uh, you know we have Jaeger, you know, which is our sort of open implementation of yeah. this stuff. I mean, you know, I, I think that making sure that we stay true to that versus actually having this essentially be. And again, I don't want to call out anybody specifically. I don't know all the details there, but I think that that's a place where we're seeing a lot of interrupt, a lot of vendor, you know, commercial products associated with it. That's all fine and good, but I think we, we, we want to make sure that there's at least a path around independent utility that's, that's completely open around this thing. Okay. All right, I think that's uh, added a bit more clarity that we can start trying to write up a bit more clearly. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Is that the end? I think so. One. What's What's next? Yeah. Q and A. I think we have one minute left. <laughs> um, the only thing to note is next week we have our project presentation, our community presentation session. Right now, there's only Weave uh, Flux, I believe, signed up. I need to double check. But if there's other projects that want to uh, take some slots to present next week, please reach out to me or. Liz, and, and we'll do our best to include you in that project presentation uh, meeting next week. We actually need to um, figure out how we get presentations to the SIGs. Yeah, it's the other thing uh, starts getting down. Yeah. Yeah. It's a I good job. Using SIGs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amy, we have Amy. Yeah. Well, I think once we get more SIGs going, it'll be easier to delegate them down because we've. The, the kind of compromise we said is every day now is just like whatever projects want to show up essentially and, and present to kind of get through the backlog at least. Okay. For what it's worth, we're going to have um, a, um, a proof point of this where Longhorn is going to is looking to present to the storage um, oh, cool. in a couple of weeks and then present to the talk straight after that. Awesome. Fantastic. That's good to hear. All right, bang on time. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Bye. Take care, all.